Good evening, everybody. Nice to see such a fully filled lecture hall. I see the last people coming in. Please take a seat um, so we can start. Um, welcome on behalf of Radboud Viflex and Radboud Gender and Diversity Studies. Um, and tonight we'll, be, we'll dive into the science and into the story about uh, testosterone. Um, what is this tiny molecule to which we address masculinity? Um, where did this idea come from and what is true of it? Um, what if we let go of the idea of testosterone as the male sex hormone? What will that mean? What for kind of implications would it have for our society? Um, today we invited Rebecca Jordan Young together with Radboud Gender and Diversity Studies and she's going to address these, um, these topics and these questions. Um, and I will want to uh, read a small uh, part on the back side of her book in which she says, uh, testosterone is a familiar villain, a ready explanation for innumerable social phenomena um, from the stock market crash and the overrepresentation of men in prison to male dominance in business and politics. It's a lot to pin on a simple molecule. Um, I hope you will uh, make us a lot wiser because I think for me, for instance, also thought that a lot was to could be explained about testosterone and also in sports, testosterone is a small problem because we make female and male different. Uh, um, we, we divide male and female in sports and this is all about, uh, this is all uh, science in which this is um, uh, stated. Um, Rebecca John Young will uh, give a lecture of approximately 40 minutes um, and then she will participate in a discussion with historian Stefan Duding. Um, this discussion will be led by Simon Gusman, a philosopher at Radboud University. Um, and there will also be room for questions from you. So I think the last 15 minutes of this program, there will be a question from the audience. Um, Rebecca Jordan Young is professor in uh, women's gender and sexuality studies um, at Bernard College of Columbia University. Um, Stefan Duding is professor in cultural sexual studies at Rabat Gender and Diversity Studies. Uh, and Simon Gusman teaches visual culture and fundamental philosophy at Rabat University, and he's also editor at Philosophy uh, Magazine. Um, my name is Dave Willems. I'm a program manager at Rabat Reflex, um, and I would love to give the floor to Rebecca Jordan Young. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming out. Um, I will tell you at the outset that I am having visual problems, so I cannot see you, but I can see that there are a lot of you. And so thank you for being here. Um, I would also ask if it is at all possible to lower these lights a little, because I cannot actually see my text. Is it, is it possible? Is that a possibility? Maybe not. OK, well, I'll do what I can. but. It may turn out I see nothing, so, <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, before going into my talk, uh, two things. I want to first uh, just thank you very much, both to Rodbad Gender and Diversity Studies for inviting me, for Marika um, uh, Vandenbrink in particular, for Dave Willems of Rodbad Reflects, for Stefan, for agreeing to read the work and be in conversation with me, and uh, Simon, who I had not met before, but look forward to having as part of this. Thanks to everyone. Uh, I will also say that uh, your agenda for what, what all we could talk about with testosterone is so huge, I cannot possibly get to all of those things tonight, and I've tried to take a little slice of it in my presentation. Sadly, I don't think I get to where would we be? What would our world look like if we didn't pin so much on testosterone? But I hope to convince you by the end of the talk that we are asking too much from this one steroid hormone. So testosterone has been culturally endowed with aspirational, almost magical qualities since before the hormone was first synthesized in 1935. And scientists told the first and most important stories about this hormone. One of the earliest came from a sensational speech delivered 
by the, ah, there we go, eminent French-American physiologist and neurologist Charles-Edouard brown Sicard at a meeting of the Société de Biologie of Paris in 1989, 1889. Excuse me. He reported the miraculous effects of what has become one of the most famous auto-experiments of all time, in which he injected himself with an elixir made of testicular extracts from dogs and guinea pigs as well as some other things, which you'll hear about. What in the world possessed this world-renowned scientist to treat himself with this brew? In short, he was fed up with being old. By his early 60s, he was, quote, so weak that I was always compelled to sit down after half an hour's work in the laboratory. So first, he experimented with grafting the testicles from young guinea pigs onto older male dogs. So you notice old, young, cross species, there's a lot going on, in a bid to restore some of the dog's youthful features. The experiments were mostly unsuccessful, but that didn't dampen his enthusiasm. He moved on to rejuvenating older male rabbits, and, quote, the good effects produced in all those animals, he wrote, he wrote left him, quote, resolved to make experiments on myself. Mixing an elixir consisting of water, blood from the testicular veins, semen, and, quote, juice extracted from a testicle crushed immediately after it has been taken from a dog or a guinea pig, he injected himself 10 times over a three-week period, noting a radical change in just one day after the first injection. After three injections, he felt that his forearm strength was restored to that of three decades earlier, and both his stamina at work and his, quote, facility of intellectual labor had returned to prior levels. Some of the most dramatic effects may seem, with hindsight, to be the most surprising. For example, his comparative measurements showed that his jet of urine was 25% longer after the initial injection. <laughs> now, he couldn't pinpoint whether it was the dog or the guinea pig that was responsible for the potion's punch, but, quote, the two kinds of animals have given a liquid endowed with a very great power. The improvements lasted for a month, after which time he, this is an interesting quote, gradually, though rapidly, went completely back to baseline on each of his measurements. Further proof, he said, of the effect of what he called the spermatic fluid. Despite what appeared to be great promise, brown Sicard's experiment was quickly debunked on physiological grounds, as well as being criticized for building up false hopes of a fountain of youth. An editorial in the Boston Medical and Surgical Journal, which is now known as the New England Journal of Medicine, cautioned of a, quote, silly season that could encourage charlatans and quacks making mischief. Quote, the sooner the general public, and especially septuagenarian, the 70s, people in their 70s, readers of the latest sensation understand that for the physically used up and worn out, there is no secret of rejuvenation. No elixir of youth, youth, the better. So brown Sicard was building on an already old idea that the testicular tissue contained the substance responsible for strength and virility, even for masculinity itself. In the decades that followed, dedicated to un scientists who were dedicated to uncovering the cause of what they observed as radical, dramatic sex differences looked to where they understood that sex was rooted, which was the gonads, the testicles or the ovaries. Unable to study testosterone directly because biochemistry did not yet exist, uh, they had to come up with interesting experiments, often involving castrating animals, observing what happened after they castrated them, which functions and parts of the body tissues were affected, and then focus, they were focusing it, as they looked for those effects, focusing on what they considered to be either masculine effects or feminine effects taken away by castration. Um, in particular, they looked at uh, mounting behavior, the part of the reproductive repertoire where one animal climbs on another in order to mate, in, and they were looking at a lot of rodents. They then sought to restore, after castrating, they sought to bring those effects back by implanting bits of testicular tissue. They watched to see what functions were restored, and then if a function was restored, they attributed that change to the glands themselves and the secretions from the little tiny bits of tissue. But unfortunately, even with these rigorous experiments, 
even with the way they told the story and pulled out the data in a way that was really looking for a linear narrative between the tissue, the function, masculinity. Still, the findings were a bit messy for them. They called them paradoxical, anomalous, strange, puzzling, unexpected, because the, the substances themselves turned out to not be sex exclusive, and because their functions went well beyond determining sexual characteristics. So testosterone, for example, influences many biological processes in all humans, in, in most animals where it, where it is, including things like in humans, heart function, liver, liver metabolism, bone development, and so on. So just isolating the effects to sexual functions um, turned out to create a lot of puzzles. But these puzzling and contradictory findings did little to undermine the idea that these were sex hormones and that testosterone in particular is, quote, the male sex hormone or the most important male sex hormone, the molecular driver of all things masculine. So the hallmarks of testosterone uh, is that it's yoked exclusively to men and the hormone's effects are credited as the primary drivers of sexual development and differences of men from women. Therefore, you see, it's less a function of the evidence overall that has accumulated than of the shape of the idea that scientists began with and the tools they built, the research program, in order to search for it. This is not to say that testosterone doesn't do a lot of those things, but one of the, one of the things I have become increasingly convinced of as I've worked on testosterone is that not that it doesn't really do anything very much or it's not so important, but instead that it does so many things and in fact is such an active substance biologically, so dynamic and because it's embedded in systems, so ultimately unpredictable in the kinds of models we have that capturing it in a masculinity framework really doesn't do justice to what this molecule is. Nonetheless, in subsequent decades, other researchers picked up where brown saccard had left off as if there had been no critical interruption. Top medical journals published reports of experiments covering an impressive array of techniques, subjects, and specific research aims. There were more rejuvenation experiments with grafting. Uh, this is more from Sicard, the elixir of life. Uh, yeah. There we go. It's quite interesting, all the different things that were attributed. But um, there were more rejuvenation experiments with implanting and grafting of testes from younger to older animals and preparations based on testes from goats, rams, and boars were injected into men. Testes from younger men were implanted into older men. The aims were impressively broad, from countering senility, impotence, muscular weakness, and flagging libido, to, quote, curing homosexuality by replacing afflicted men's testes with those of, quote, normal men. Many of the claims and aims went well beyond what contemporary ideas about testosterone would lead us to expect. Leo Stanley was the chief surgeon at San Quentin Prison in Northern California for almost four decades. He had explicit eugenic goals and an enormous pool of people on whom to experiment. Under Stanley's knife or supervision, more than 10,000 testicular implantation operations took place at San Quentin Prison, which he claimed cured the following. Quote, cases of neurasthenia, senility, asthma, paralysis, agitans, epilepsy, dementia, precox, diabetes, locomotor ataxia, impotency, tuberculosis, paranoia, gangrene of the toe, atrophied testicles, <laughs> rheumatism, and quote, on and on, many other illnesses of chronic character not amenable to treatment. He was emboldened by his intervention and said the recipients of the treatment, quote, claim that their eyesight is improved. I should really get some more <laughs> immediately. The appetite is increased. I don't so much need that. There's a feeling of buoyancy, a joy of living, increased energy, loss of tired feeling, increased mental activity and many other beneficial effects. So amazing. It's magic. Serge Voronoff the great Russian surgeon who had worked with Brown Saccard may have made the grandest claim of all. Quote, the testicular matter 
pours into the stream of blood a species of vital fluid which restores the energy of all cells and spreads happiness. <laughs> At a medical meeting in London in 1923, Voronoff announced that the Pasteur Institute's construction of an immense park in Africa would place the elixir of youth within the reach of everyone. Among other things, um, it was the... Oops, I've, this doesn't make any sense, and I can't read it, so I can't help you. But you see, it's going to be in the reach of everyone. It's the democratization of the el elixir of youth because it's, so, it's going to be so simple to synthesize. Now, it's easy today to look askance at these claims, which often come across as outlandish, sometimes blatantly racist. Um, I didn't present that to you in this, but it's connected some with the monkey glands and the prospect of the great park in Africa. It's tied in with several of the other experiments. Um, or simply quackish. Today, any surgeon hawking a procedure to remedy the array of problems that Leo Stanley recited would be greeted with immediate skepticism, not just by their colleagues, but uh, probably by most lay people as well. Yet, as much as the narratives of testosterone, or T, as I'll call it in the rest of the talk often, have changed, one thing has remained constant. T isn't just potent, it's omnipotent, it's magic. In 2017, an internal company memo that became an international news story, uh, in, in, a, in this memo, an engineer at Google, James Damore, blamed the dearth of women in tech on biology, especially on a lack of testosterone. Damore's memo was important not because it represented the fairly conventional thinking of one particular computer engineer, but because it was written and circulated at a time when Silicon Valley was engaging with questions of inequity and bias broadly in the industry and was coming under fire for having so few women in the highest pay, high prestige positions. Also because it directly challenged Google's program for addressing discrimination. Incidentally, though the common narrative is that Damore was fired because of what he said in the memo and because it went against some sort of gender orthodoxy, it's also important to remember he was fired for breaking company protocol by not only uh, reaching out, he wasn't authorized to send communications to everybody within the entire company, but to do so in a manner that directly criticized and harshly challenged the company policy was seen as, as an a sort of insubordination in the company, but that part of the narrative uh, gets, gets lost a bit. It's just interesting. I digress. Damore is just one in a very long line of spokespeople for T as an architect of structural inequality. He followed in the footsteps, for example, of the political commentator and former New Republic editor of conservative magazine, Andrew Sullivan, who wrote a very widely cited, frequently cited cover story on testosterone for the New York Times magazine in the year 2000. In that, he declared, and is often quoted, that T, quote, helps explain, perhaps better than any other single factor, why inequalities between men and women remain so frustratingly resilient in public and private life. So for almost any social ill or problem, it seems someone out there peddles the idea that T is to blame. Why are there so many more men in prison? Because T drives aggression and antisocial behavior. So naturally, men with their higher T get locked up more often or the ubiquity of rape in the armed forces. Quote, gee whiz, the hormone level created by nature sets in place the possibility for these types of things to occur. This was spoken in a United States Senate hearing um, in 2013 by a senator from Georgia, on, and the hearing was on sexual assault in the armed forces. In 2016, in an episode that some of you maybe are familiar with, the far-right politician Geert Wilders, pardon my pronunciation, um, folded immigration fears and anti-Islam diatribe into this narrative when he called migrant men, quote, Islamic testosterone bombs, as he handed out spray cans of red paint to women to protect against sexual assault from the asylum seekers that he said made Dutch women unsafe. Again, that's a lot to pin on a single molecule. 
T-Talk is a term that my co-author Katrina Carcasis and I developed for the web of direct claims and indirect associations that circulate around testosterone, both as a material substance and as a very common, widely known and embraced, um, we would say multivalent or uh, not always in, in one direction. It, uh, it's very flexible and accommodating kind of cultural symbol. I want to pause my talk to say I should have at the outset said that everything I'm presenting is from a co-authored work. The, the book, Testosterone and Unauthorized Biography, was really very fully uh, a partnership conceived and written with my colleague Katrina, who I mentioned. So back to that. Testosterone and tea talk. Tea talk weaves folklore into science, weaves them together, as scientific claims about tea seemingly validate cultural beliefs about the structure of masculinity and the, quote, natural relationship between women and men. The root of all tea talk is the sex hormone concept, whereby testosterone and estrogen are elevated as the primary hormones for males and females, respectively. With the sex hormone concept, tea and its, quote, partner, estrogen, are framed as a heteronormative binary pair. They're, they're binary, they're dichotomous, and they're exclusive. They're a couple, each one belonging to one sex or the other, and they're locked into an inevitable and natural, quote, war of the sexes. This idea, our work builds this up, building on extensive critiques by biologists and historians and other feminist scholars, many of whom, a particularly wonderful bunch of them are Dutch, I thought you'd like to know that, who have shown how this concept, uh, the sex hormone concept, shapes how scientific information about testosterone is gathered and interpreted. And it blocks the, rep uh, the recognition and integration and acceptance of scientific uh, observations observations that don't fit into that model. Um, resting on the sex hormone concept, the idea of T-talk also goes beyond it. So uh, one of the important ways that it does that is it lends what we call truthiness, borrowing from the comic uh, Stephen Colbert. Uh, certain arguments would seem just like stories or like opinion, but when you, call, when you call in testosterone to the story, suddenly it sounds material, biological, and scientific, so it gives it a little bit more heft. It also gives it a more modern and cutting-edge feel. Sometimes, just calling in testosterone um, as an argument about the super-substance, it not only substitutes for any actual evidence in a claim, but it makes it um, seem like you're being obstinate, thick-headed, just annoyingly contrarian if you ask for evidence. What is the evidence of that? And this is something that we've encountered many times, especially in our work on sports. Also, while testosterone can simply stand in as a word and a concept for masculinity, which itself is an abstraction, um, testosterone uh, can just symbol, uh, symbolize biology or nature even more generally, as well as the associated values of objectivity and science. So, um, third, stories about testosterone are threaded through with what you could think of as animism. The idea that the molecule itself is a willful being, a willful character with consciousness, with intentions and plans. There are uh, instances where we have found in um, documentaries, for example, a, a very well-known radio show that was supposed to be based on new emerging evidence where there's uh, a story about testosterone whispering instructions in the ears of men who should know better. Um, but it's clear with this kind of story that testosterone has a plan, and the plan is to maintain the natural order of things. So... Resistance is futile, if that's the, the plan. Across the domains that we examine in the book, we see T-talk working both in science and at odds with science. Sometimes evidence flies in the face of received wisdom, while T-talk fits folklore very tightly, like a glove. Um, at the same time, much of the evidence that's generated through science uh, itself is shaped by the same concepts that circulate in T-Talk. So researchers 
often frame their studies in ways that anticipate familiar conclusions, and they may overlook or ignore unexpected or contradictory nuggets of evidence, certainly not always, and importantly, there is a great variety to testosterone research, and it's a very interesting multiple set of overlapping fields. In fact, in order to make the critiques that we do in the book, we use a method that we call triangulation, where we try to pull different pieces of observation from different fields and say, if this is true in this field over here, can this observation also be true? Or to give an example, um, of a piece of information that is widely known and um, uh, integrated into research in one field, but ignored in other fields, there's the, the commonly understood fact that testosterone, um, some of it your body uses directly when it attaches to androgen receptors, but some of it the body converts to estrogen. And some of the actions that are observed to and credited to testosterone, careful experimentation that either blocks the conversion of testosterone to estrogen, or, for example, genetic experiments um, on some animals where they take away the uh, receptors for androgens. If you do that, um, you can begin to understand which of the effects are actually directly from testosterone and which effects happen only after it's converted to estrogen. Those kinds of experiments are not even possible in certain other fields, but to keep that in mind as a mechanism of how testosterone works, certain fields operate as though that is not relevant and it, it would have no bearing. Um, so that's just one small example of how we try to think across different fields and think what's known over here that could change the way work is done over there. I'm going to jump to a, um, a specific example uh, on risk taking and just to say that my point overall with this is not to say science is bad, science is not important, uh, it's all tainted. In fact, I am scientifically trained, I am a scientist myself, and I care deeply about evidence. And one of the things that is, for me, the most complicated and interesting projects that I have is how to understand the way that science is embedded in the social world, in social processes, in our frames of thought, in our histories, our language that separates sex into binary and makes it so important above other things. At the one hand, science is always social, and there is no such thing as scraping off the social and doing pure science. And I could say more later about some other ways that people have begun to think about actually directly confronting the social aspects of science and making our methods more rigorous to account for it. But I say all this to say, Please don't misunderstand. I am not anti-science. That's not the, the message. I think instead that we want to try to figure out complex, clear-eyed ways of understanding some of our limitations so that maybe we can make space for um, other ways of approaching our bodies, masculinity, femininity, gender broadly, etc. So let me now tell you one particular story about how testosterone research is making connections. On her birthday in the fall of 1901, Annie Edson Taylor rode out to the middle of the Niagara River and contemplated the rough horseshoe falls with a famous drop of 167 feet, which is about 50 meters, I think. With the help of two men, she strapped herself into a wooden pickle barrel, weighted with a 200-pound anvil and lined with a few cushions. She placed a plastic air tube between her lips while the, bar while the barrel was pressurized with a bicycle pump and then sealed. At 63, in a black silk dress and a jeweled choker circling her throat, hair up swept, uh, swept up and dressed with a single ostrich feather, Taylor looked decidedly more elegant than intrepid. Uh, at four o'clock in the afternoon, she was released 
into the Niagara River and immediately was swept up in the very fast current. Five billion gallons of water per hour flow over these falls to the grass island below. During her mile-long trip down the river to the lip of the falls, Taylor submerged out of sight several times, but always re-emerged. About 20 minutes later, she tumbled over the edge of the river and into the cascade. She hit bottom in less than a minute, the first person to ever to make it over Niagara Falls and survive. The next day's New York Times trumpeted, woman goes over Niagara in a barrel. She is alive, but suffering greatly from shock. Taylor had been born wealthy, but after her husband David was killed in the U.S. Civil War, she was plagued by financial troubles. By 1898, she had crossed the North American continent eight times looking for work, but she was never able to get on a stable footing. She was impoverished and living in a boarding house when she got the idea to go over Niagara Falls in a barrel. No one had ever done it, so she thought this feat might give her notoriety and, crucially, some money. The accomplishment did bring her notoriety, but it was never lucrative. She worked as a street vendor near the falls for another 20 years and died penniless in 1921. According to popular thinking and a good deal of scientific research, men are more likely to be risk takers, and that tendency can be traced to their generally much higher levels of testosterone, both early in development and circulating as adults. So, you might think I began with the story of Annie Taylor to argue that the great women daredevils have been overlooked by history, or more broadly, that women take risks too, or that we have testosterone too, doggone it, and we should also be studied to see how that hormone affects our behavior. None of those are my point. Instead, I began with Taylor to draw a contrast between her story and the way that risks are conceptualized in research on testosterone and risk-taking, which inherently places the engine of risk inside individual bodies. Stories like that of Annie Taylor highlight how gender, poverty, and other forms of social status interact to structure someone's life chances and choices, and the risks and benefits that different actions represent for specific people. Now, she was probably unusually daring and creative in presuming that going over Niagara Falls in a barrel was going to help her out, but desperation can make people take dramatic risks. Keeping her in the back of our minds, Katrina, my co-author and I, set out to understand the research on testosterone and risk-taking and to see how it might be structured around particular assumptions. In the field of behavioral neuroendocrinology, there is broad, though not unanimous, consensus that steroid hormones, especially high testosterone combined with low cortisol, which might be familiar to you as the stress hormone, that these, this combination affects risk preferences. I need to quickly look for Dave and see where I am. Good, thank you. One of the most influential models has been the study of financial behavior, both in the real-world setting of financial trading and in laboratory-based games. In the remainder of, of my talk, I'm going to just mention inconsistencies in the financial research uh, on testosterone and risk to show how tea talk, as I described before, isn't just about gender hierarchies, but part of what it does is help to naturalize other aspects of the social order, especially social class, economics, um, and uh, I don't really get to that in this talk because I'm focusing on the finance studies, but also race, racial hierarchies. I'd hope to consider, um, no, I'm going to, I'm going to move along. A quick and dirty overview of the studies and the underlying theory that links testosterone to risk-taking requires that we digress for a moment into popular versions of the story of sexual selection in evolution. In the popular versions, um, testosterone is the uh, mechanism, we call it the proximate mechanism or the first step, the nearest step, that supposedly ensures that males compete take risks, and want lots of sex, a suite of traits and behavioral strategies that give greater reproductive success to men uh, in the story than they would to women. Women who bear a greater physical burden in reproduction 
can produce only a fraction of the number of offspring that men could. So women, it goes, must be cautious and choosy about mates. For men, on the other hand, the cost of reproduction is low. So the more partners and the more encounters, the better. I don't have time to take apart this familiar story. I want to not leave you with the impression that I'm endorsing it. And I want to say one of the best deconstructions of that that's quite accessible but also quite rigorous is in Cordelia Fine's recent book, Testosterone Rex. So I'll give a shout out to Cordelia. In this model, men have to compete among themselves to be lucky enough to reproduce at all, while women don't have this pressure. So this pushes men to be risk takers. And they also need to take risks to gather the resources to offer to women so that they will mate with them. So men have evolved to be promiscuous, risk-taking, competitive, while women uh, evolved um, an inclination to play it safe. And um, you can see all of these. Uh, these were just, I pulled up a couple of days ago. I did a couple of searches on uh, just restricting, uh, risk-taking in humans in a number of recent years. You see, this is a very active research area. And what's interesting is you can see across these that um, some of the other domains that are brought into it include, um, oh, the second one, unfortunately, a bird one sneaked in, so ignore that. But uh, <laughs> um, power posing, religiosity, the idea that women are more religious and men less so, as is shown in many uh, surveys in Western nations because of uh, testosterone, that financial risk preference, adolescent risk taking, we could go on and on. All these different forms of either risk or conservatism get tied to the story of testosterone. So the concept of risk in risk taking research is broad. It's also idiosyncratic and strongly male biased, often omitting behaviors that are not perceived as risky simply because they're undertaken by women. Many of the most frequently cited studies do involve money. And uh, in particular, there are a wide array of, of financial um, games that are used and things like entrepreneurs get studied and so on. So I want to talk briefly about this study of entrepreneurs. Uh, it's useful, actually, to just take a look if you do a quick search of entrepreneurs. What's the image that you get? It's helpful. So the idea uh, that entrepreneurship, that starting a new venture um, would be associated with testosterone, got explored by a, an evolutionary psychologist, a, a team of evolutionary psychologists and a business professor. And they uh, tell the same familiar evolutionary story, but one of the super interesting things that they do is um, actually project money and the accumulation of finance into sort of deep human history, which is, is, is sort of hilarious. But they, they explain in the middle of the, the narrative that they create, they, ex they have to build a, um, a network of theory to link what they're talking about to evolution. And so they connect it to whole streams of research. Part of it is on risk, and part of that is on status. So they look over here and say, we see that in these studies by the famous sociologist James Dabbs, testosterone has been uh, linked to occupational status. So we pin down that corner of the theory and we move on. And I say, but wait, I know this study over here, and what you're doing is actually you're suggesting higher testosterone, the higher economic and social status of entrepreneurs. But these studies that you cited showed that higher testosterone was associated with lower occupational status. So in fact, this is a kind of conceptual move we see often. There's a quick reference. There is this association. But actually, what that association is undermines, not builds, the study. Likewise, there's a set of studies, the most common single model uses um, something called the Iowa gambling task. So remember the evolutionary story. Risk taking is important for men in particular because they need to take risks to have a lot of sex, to get a lot of partners, and to get resources to offer to the partners. So risk taking is associated with more resource accumulation, right? 
But the Iowa gambling task is a game that was actually devised to measure pathological risk taking, where you take a kind of pattern of behavior where over time, you're not choosing the strategy that will actually cause you to accumulate resources, but you choose a strategy that gives you short-term rewards, but in the long run, in fact, you lose the game. Um, I won't go into the details of how the game is played right now, but it's just, it's two different decks of cards, and people are given a chance to play with the cards, and they choose the deck that they prefer. The one deck gives short-term high rewards, but over the long run, you lose money. The other deck, it's slow and steady, but you gain money. So the idea is the risky strategy in the IGT is the one that's tied to the quick thrill, the fast reward. But in the long run, you end up with no resources. You can't use that model and plug it into the same evolutionary story that says this is the thing that evolved so that it, that it was more adaptive for men to take risks because they accumulated resources and had more reproductive success. Do you follow? Nod big if you're following me. Yes? Does that make sense? Because I can't see your face. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Um, so those are just two quick ways. Uh, I, I don't have much time, if any, but I do want to... Oh, I do. Excellent. Let me tell you about one more... Um, I just actually want to say this is, uh, um, I just pause for a second on the IGT. And um, I want to say, if you didn't already scratch your head over how they tie this to the same story of evolution, in um, the studies, in particular, like this one on Jack Van Honk, but he in particular has been an important researcher here, um, the, the risky strategy is actually uh, one that they have found is more often one taken by women. So the overall inconsistency of the network of patterns somehow manages to not trouble people studying this model. So in this case, sometimes what I take issue with is not the design or findings of a particular study, but it's how that study gets folded in to a broader narrative that overall doesn't actually make sense. It doesn't actually all support the same understanding. So one of the most famous studies of all um, was uh, conducted by a uh, team that included what, um, John Coates, who, who was a financial trader before he went back and trained more and became a neuroscientist. And uh, he and his partner, Joe Herbert, a psychologist, did a study of young male traders on the financial floor in London. This particular study had been actually, uh, after it was published, it was published um, shortly before the great economic collapse of 2008. And people picked up on this finding and said, hey, if women had been in charge of the world economic system, they wouldn't have taken these crazy risks because the problem is all these young men doing financial trading get too competitive. They, got, they get all caught up. The more competitive they are, the higher their testosterone goes, the higher their testosterone goes, the more risks they take. Ah! And the whole thing was going to just bound to fall apart. We need women in it. So I'm all for more women in professions in general, but this particular story, I think, isn't the best way to try to argue to get women into any profession. And um, for this particular study, um, one of the things that's interesting is Coates and Herbert did use a more sophisticated model of testosterone, and it's this reciprocal influence model, not just the idea that the hormone in one direction causes things to happen, but that they understand and draw on observations from animal research and from other human studies that say what you do in the world, what activities you take, how you exercise, whether you're having sex, whether you're even thinking about sex and how often, how, what sort of exercise you do, what's your relative status in a group, actually all of those things have been shown to affect testosterone production. It is an incredibly dynamic molecule in very quick changing ways. So it's dynamic, it's fluid, it responds to our social situations. Interestingly for humans, there's much more data about how testosterone responds to behavior and the social world than there is 
evidence that it affects and, and pushes behavior in a certain way. So in this study, they uh, gathered testosterone over five days, morning and afternoon, from 17 uh, male traders. Uh, and they, their hypothesis um, was that this winner's effect, that, on, uh, that wins in the market would cause testosterone to go up and they would then take more risks. They reported that traders' testosterone was higher on days when they made more than their daily average. They also said that higher levels of tea in the morning correlated with higher profits in the afternoon. And they mentioned some findings about uh, higher cortisol. Their findings, they said, successfully tracked along their hypothesis about testosterone and cortisol. But it turns out that that interpretation requires a very big retrofit. The data do not actually support the prediction that rising profits would lead to rising T, which in turn would lead to more risk. In fact, they don't even run the analyses to test that particular hypothesis. So what you would have had to do to test that, like I said, they had data over five days, morning and afternoon. If the hypothesis is that when you make more money, it drives your testosterone up and then you take more risks, what you need to do is first see, does testosterone change following uh, the trading events of the day? So that requires a change measure. You would have to subtract the morning T level from the afternoon T level. It's a very simple thing. What's amazing is these guys are, they're not stupid. I don't think they didn't know better, but they never ever reported a change measure. There's no change measure. They don't even test it. Nor do they look at how profits or testosterone one day leads over the course of several days. In other words, they find some significant associations, but those associations are not the things that you would need not only to prove their theory, but even to test their theory. For me, the most interesting thing about this is that this study was reported in the very prestigious Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, the most prestigious general interest science journal there is. How did it come past the reviewers without ever even testing uh, the hypothesis? So with that, I just want to say it's tea talk. Tea is not the only story or even the dominant story, but it's always handy. It's always sitting there on the shelf to be pulled down when it's convenient to essentialize a social pattern, a hierarchy, something that instead of looking really at the structure of the markets, at looking at what's at risk, one of the things that we might say is, why would you think financial traders are the pinnacle of risk? What, in fact, are they risking? Other people's money, right? For the most part, those are not the people who suffered tremendously. Those are not the people who had massive things at stake. Likewise, when research on bold leadership style risk is done, it's done on upper class, white professionals, business students, entrepreneurs, etc. When the interest is pathology, it's when the interest is problematic risk taking, antisocial behavior, etc teenagers, people of color, inner city residents, et cetera, et cetera, are the subject population. There's a way in which by figuring finance, this realm of finance as the pinnacle of risk, it, it takes forward the idea that these are the bold natural leaders. Obviously, in any of the studies of financial risk, entrepreneurs or others, you have to have money, for example, to invest money. But there are other studies that take that into account and that would already suggest that biology is not really playing a role in this. So these studies keep alive an idea that social structures inherently flow from our bodies. And I'm not in any way saying our bodies are not embedded in social structures. I'm fascinated by how testosterone responds and engages in the social world, but to think that our structures, whether it's gender or class or race, flow from this molecule already distorts and omits what we know about this molecule, and it gets in the way of precise 
interesting mechanistic information that could help us in a lot of other realms. So I think I will just end with this, that questions about biology and human nature are inextricable from moral and political debates about the value of human variations, the possibilities for equality, and the urgency and feasibility of social change. This book emanated from our work on the regulation of women athletes' testosterone levels. And that, ref that uh, regulation relied on a narrow and distorted, quote, science of testosterone that rested on a static, binary, sex hormone view of testosterone. We learned about people doing other science that would challenge that, and, but it was left out of anything that counted as science in the regulation. That view in this regulation was used to justify bodily, psychic, economic, and social harms on women athletes. This is one of the most concrete places where it's been applied. Um, those harms are broad, difficult to fully assess. We hold on to hope that better thinking about testosterone will actually dislodge some of the... Um, Static thinking that connects the idea of some chemical that's whispering instructions in all of our ears to hold the status quo. In fact, I think that it might be possible, yet possibly, to dislodge that. I invite you into the conversation. I thank you for engaging with me so far. And I think I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Professor Jordan Jung. I have many questions to ask you, but first uh, I wanted to ask Professor uh, Dubink um, uh, for your view. You, you wanted to elaborate on the historical aspects yeah. of uh, this research. Okay, well... Thanks very much for a talk that is as impressive as the book is. If you haven't seen or read it, uh, go and buy it. It is a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, and one of the things why, the reasons why it is so wonderful is that even if you have a sort of a professional skepticism about the kind of research that Rebecca so beautifully unpicks, even if you have already have that kind of skepticism, you will be baffled by um, just how powerful that research is, research that clearly is very debatable, that clearly is not up to par in many ways. Nevertheless, that research is unbelievably powerful. It is powerful within science. It is the research that gets quoted and quoted and quoted again and serves as the foundation under entire research fields. And it is an, uh, um, very powerful in society. It's very powerful because it helps to legitimize all kinds of given ideas about men, women, differences between men and women, and the nature of masculinity. So it is questionable research that at the same time is deeply, deeply powerful. Um, I was baffled by <laughs> just how powerful and questionable at the same time it is. And I think this really um, begs the question, why? How can this be? And Rebecca has pointed to tea talk, which I always think of as tea talk, you know, isn't tea, but it's an entirely <laughs> right. different thing, has pointed to tea talk as the thing that underlies this. But I think there's more to be said about what exactly drives tea talk. Yeah. And I think one of the things that drives tea talk is connected to the nature of masculinity, the nature as in the way that masculinity is culturally constructed in our world. And I think one of the characteristics of modern masculinity, of masculinity in modernity, is that it is inherently unstable. It's mm. an inherently unstable category. And one of the things that T promises to do, and one of the things that T uh, promises to do in particular at the moment when testosterone gets 
uh, discovered slash invented in the late 19th century is that it promises to solve these difficulties within masculinity. It seems to carry mm. the promise of stabilizing masculinity. It locates masculinity in the body. It locates masculinity in a, uh, a molecule that is immune to outside influence. Mm. It uh, connects masculinity to masculinity at other times and other places as in evolutionary thinking, exactly in the same way that masculinity is being imagined in the late 19th century mm. as a masculinity that has been lost by men in the West but is still being possessed by men in other parts of the world or was possessed by men in uh, times that are, have disappeared into the mist of history. So... All of these um, instabilities around masculinity in one way or another get resolved by this magical uh, um, uh, molecule. So I think what we need to do is to think really carefully historically and in a very specific way about exactly which kinds of instabilities mm -hmm. within masculinity get resolved by T at what time in right. particular. And I think the example that you started with about rejuvenation is a wonderful example of this and that we, we could find many, many examples of this in the present as well and think mm -hmm. about which... Uh, instabilities in masculinity exactly get resolved by T. So it is T talk, but we need to be wary of the fact that we shouldn't speak too general, I think, about mm -hmm. T talk, but be really specific about which kind of instabilities in current constructions of masculinity are being <coughs> resolved by T talk. That's a fantastic insight. And um, I think... Uh, I think in the book I do, we do a better job of that than I was able to point to in the, in the talk now. But one of the things in particular is to think about how, in fact, there are very particular testosterone seems to have this flexibility to uh, carry specific forms of masculinity. So, for example, a, a crisis of bourgeois masculinity of someone who has been. Um, uh, emasculated by too much work in the office, for example, too aging in the lab, whatever is going on with Brown Sicard, there's a particular um, reaching, just like the marketing of testosterone to aging men, or right now, the marketing uh, which creates, it, it extends the aging market to younger and younger and younger mm -hmm. men to take advantage of some insecurities about masculinity to suggest that even men... Uh, in their 20s might do well to boost their testosterone. Likewise, um, one thread that we carry uh, in the book is looking at the way uh, testosterone and violence is figured and to look at a really intense both um, class narrative around uh, why is it that um, working class men, so the same... Uh, ev evidence that I referred to very briefly in terms of the, the research that showed men with lower status occupations have higher testosterone. So the narrative that the researchers who did that work came up with was that um, too much testosterone causes some people, in particular men, but also women with too much testosterone, suffer from the same problem of being too impulsive too aggressive, they won't follow rules, they're antisocial, etc. They don't do well in organizations, they can't pay close enough attention in schools, so they don't complete higher education. In other words, there's a vision that too much testosterone is an engine of the class structure, and people end up in a particular occupational status, end up with a particular educational attainment, particular jobs, because they're not suited to at higher education and professional life. Meanwhile, somehow, upper-class men with a lot of testosterone become financial traders, are entrepreneurs, are the leaders and CEOs and titans of industry. So there's a flexibility in the tea talk that is quite suited to stabilizing particular concerns. I think there's, um, right at this moment, there's an interesting phenomenon of I think of this idea of using testosterone as a precision technology to just just choose a kind of menu style. Which parts of masculinity would you want? And the idea that you could take this and not that. And it's a so um, I think it's probably a bigger discussion and argument than I could go to. 
But I absolutely agree that thinking about specificity is crucial. I think what I would need more time with you to talk about, because it's super interesting, is to think about what does it mean that they get resolved? In what way do these instabilities get resolved mm. by testosterone? And is it a resolution simply because it's an explanation? Um, and that's some of my question back. Mm. What do you think? Well, they never get fully resolved, I would say. I, I would argue that um, in the same way that masculinity itself, itself is, is, a, is a phantasmatic category, so is T, to yeah. a certain extent. They're, they're both phantasmatic categories. Masculinity seems to suppose that, that there is such a thing as a male body from which manliness then emerges and the two fit perfectly. Well, that, that's an impossibility. And the same thing is, of course, true of T, that, mm -hmm. that there is this molecule from which male bodies and then masculinity emerge. So both of them are phantasmatic and both of them are deeply, deeply um, contradictory. It is a resolution in the sense, I would say, that um, where threats to masculinity are very often envisioned in terms of society undermining manliness, mm -hmm. of society developing into such a direction that it's going to undermine manliness. Mm -hmm. Conceptualizations of T seem to be a resolution in the sense that they exclude society from right. Right. Uh, influence on the male body. And that's right. why I find it so, so, so fascinating that this research that quite clearly shows that T is affected by social circumstances, that that just doesn't seem to get heard. Right, it's there, but it seems right. it seems to have a very hard time to, to find its way to a lot of other research. So where mm -hmm. when manliness or what is supposed to be manliness, when it is affected by society, it's very hard to acknowledge that. So I think T is a solution in the sense that it seems to render manliness immune to social influences and to historical influences. That is what its its promise seems to be. But mm -hmm. that of course can never be a real solution. It's just as phantasmatic as manliness itself is. Mm -hmm. So one of the, my, my brain is spinning. It's always exciting to talk to you, and I have a lot of directions. I want to think about, like, right when you first began speaking, you talked about some of, the, a lot of the science is really not up to par. And that is true, and we do take apart, especially a lot of very classic studies that are, that are still very important and are very well cited. But we, it's also important to note that a lot of the research we're talking about is up to par oh. in the sense that it's not, that there isn't necessarily a problem. It's not bad science. It's about the way that we also have a concept of science in silos and the idea that this science is not allowed to touch that science. And if, you, if they did touch, they would destabilize each other. Oh. And part of my job, the kind of sort of meta synthesis that I do, looking across study designs and so on, is to say, what happens if you make that science talk to that science? And partly, they stay in these discrete silos because uh, you know it's, it's just technical. It has nothing to do with ideology, some of it. But it's also harder to understand and reflect upon and see the inconsistencies and the gaps in logic if, you, if they're all keeping their head down, right? So... The idea of social responsiveness, which you ended on, and the idea that a lot of studies don't take that into account is fascinating and true. But it's also true that many of the studies that do take the fact of social responsiveness into account in some ways often do it in a way that is still essentializing. Mm -hmm. And I'll give a quick example, which is... Uh, maybe the most explicit racial example I can. So there's a sociologist, Alan Mazur, who's an elected member of the American Academy of Sciences, a big, big figure. And his work very early on was precisely on this winner's effect and the idea that uh, if somebody has a social win, if their status goes up mm -hmm. in a group, say, I could even, I can assign you two to compete, and, but I rig it so that it, you're not winning according to your own skill, but you think that you've won according to skill, I can systematically uh, raise the testosterone of people who are assigned to win by being in this position. So and, and there's you know, some iffiness around the edges of some of that, but more or less there's a lot of consistent evidence. So he, along with another sociologist, Alan Booth, put this 
observation together with a bunch of other work in a huge article on testosterone and dominance in men. And there's this big section in that article that speculates on how you might use this insight to explain that what he thinks of as a racial pattern in criminality. And he's talking about what they call the, quote, inner cities, which is code word for black people and black men in particular in this work. Mm -hmm. And the idea is he calls in this, it's called a challenge hypothesis from bird research, and says that this, in the cities where their men are living under all these challenges and pressures, and it's like a constant, that this is an environment with constant social pressure, which then keeps testosterone at a high level, it keeps challenges high, they then become more aggressive and violent and so on. But the way it's actually crafted and the way it's figured, first of all, everything about the challenges doesn't come from anything in the social world. There's no racism, there's no poverty, there's no chronic unemployment, there's no racialized policing. It's purely something about the inherent chaos of black communities, the way this is written out. This is the, the theme. And likewise, it turns out, as you read and you probe this and later work, it's a pastiche. He puts together this narrative without ever having information on the behavior of the young men in the studies, even on the, on the, on the residents. He doesn't even know that they live in cities. But blackness, city, violence, it's all put together in a narrative that looks more sophisticated, and it looks like this not essential biosocial framework, but in fact, what it essentializes is the, the supposed chaotic character of black communities. So even when it gets incorporated, sometimes it's incorporated in this way. Other people, like Sari Van Anders in Canada, does this, she does cool work that's quite the opposite. It undermines that. So I want to just throw her name out as somebody who does a very different kind of work. Yeah. I could go on and on. I'll stop for a second. Say more. No, no, it's fine. Say more. Um, so um, there is such a thing as a, as a um, maybe a more objective, is that, if that's the right term, discourse about testosterone uh, and the, sign, the, sign, the proper scientific uh, research, research. Is, is that true or does every sort of form of science also contain a form of storytelling or um, folklore? Okay, um, this is a great question, which I like very much. We cannot do science without stories. We need narrative in order to decide how to approach our objects, how, what to observe, mm -hmm. how to measure and what to measure, what constitutes noise in the experiment versus what is really the thing we want to observe, and then how to interpret our findings. Um, there is better and worse research on testosterone, without question, just as there is better and worse research on anything. <laughs> I think that in my experience reading this work, I would suggest that this is a field that is especially, it's a field of research that's especially difficult to conduct um, because the object of study has such a lively life outside mm -hmm. the laboratory. Because everyone in here has ideas about testosterone you probably don't have so many ideas about C-reactive protein, is my guess. <laughs> I don't think you probably would feel threatened in your gender presentation if someone said to you, oh, you have a lot of testosterone, or you don't seem to have very much testosterone. That, as a comment, is saying something about our being in a way. It's too saturated with social meaning to do this work without really rigorously examining and understanding just what the implications are. So I would suggest that this is a field of work that really would benefit greatly from more interdisciplinary collaborations. And in that regard, I mean, a minute ago I mentioned Sari Van Anders mm -hmm. as someone who um, does super interesting interdisciplinary collaborations. She's working with testosterone reactivity, but she tries to do that in ways that don't 
uh, that challenge gender binaries, that, uh, that where she's not presuming, um, for example, the idea that everything about parenting is nurturing. So there are ways in which whole domains of behavior get attached to characteristics of masculinity or femininity, but in fact don't hold up. If people in here are parents, you know that a great deal of the interaction that you have with children is not about nurturing, it's about other forms of engagement. Um, it might be providing resources, it can be uh, teaching, it can be disciplining, it can be lots of things. But to have these very vague categories, this is a problem. The vagueness often is covered over by this sense I mentioned before that we all know what we're talking about. So we can put that part aside. We don't have to go too deeply there. Okay. Would, would you like to... Yeah, it, it's interesting that this field is, as you put it, so saturated with stories. And you would expect then that these stories are being recognized by the people in that field as stories. But at the same time, they seem to be very present, identifiable as stories, and perfectly legitimate. That, that still is, is a puzzle, that a field that is so clearly, uh, where narrative is so crucial to, to, to the scholarship, that these narratives do not get identified as such. Why is that? Because it seems to be as if these, these narratives are, have an enormous legitimacy that they wouldn't have in other fields. Mm. Well, I would be cautious about saying they wouldn't. I mean, in broader science and technology studies, in fact, shows that there are many, many um, social practices, ideas, goals, et cetera, that shape scientific endeavors across the board. I do think this is one where it's especially complicated because we use the same language inside and outside of science for a lot of things. There's a looseness of the concepts and all of that. Um, but the issue of stories, I mean, I think scientists typically are taught in a frame of um, experimentation and interpretation that um, uh, not all scientists buy this anymore, certainly. There are lo I just last week was in a group of amazing people in this neurogenderings network, some of whom are really critical uh, neuroscientists and cognitive scientists and Maybe one of them is even in here from that meeting. I don't know, but folks from the Donders Institute, a couple were there. there. There are people who know what I'm about to say, which is that the classic education in science is that there is no legitimate place for social elements in science. Mm -hmm. And there is no legitimate place for story. That objectivity is obtained by figuring out how to remove the influence of the scientist from the experiment. You come up with clever methods, clever tools and techniques to completely remove the scientist and the scientist's influence. And then you have a hypothesis or a theory, you gather data, you test the theory. If the data disprove it, you move on to a new hypothesis and so on. But every historical study of science, every social study of science shows it doesn't work in that way. And it's not to say there's no natural world out there, it's all made up, that's not right. There is a material world. We have no way to approach it except through our language, through our own cognitive structures, our own the tools that we ourselves created, the questions that we ourselves came up with for particular ends, and we have to come up with ways to interpret. Scientific education at this moment, I mean, it's something a few people are working on in lots of places, to try to actually bring a more critical social perspective of, of critical analysis into the sciences so that <coughs> saying you have a story is not a dirty word. It doesn't disqualify you from being a scientist. Right now, you can't admit it, because if you admit it, you're saying, I didn't really do science here. I did some other form of storytelling. So uh, we talked for a bit about the influence of stories on science, and now... Um, uh, the mm -hmm. other way around, the mm -hmm. influence of science on stories. So if we would listen more to this interdisciplinary research, which is a, a bit more unbiased, and uh, in that sense, mm -hmm. um, uh, mm -hmm. well, I don't know if objective is the right word, but better construed experiments, mm -hmm. how would that affect the social discourse on mm -hmm. gender identities? Again, a great question. And I think what you said about interdisciplinarity, I mean, I think part of what we need is 
interdisciplinary science, but also ways of, of making, like I said before, having different fields and branches talk to each other better. Mm -hmm. So interdisciplinary, both from outside the natural and biological sciences, but also even within uh, different uh, fields and subfields of science. I think that we would um, begin to shift closer to truths that are more, um, more accurate. Maybe there's never going to be pure objectivity, but I do think that we can get closer and further away from some kind of accuracy. And also, part of what's necessary is to think about what is the, what is the story doing? What kind of social hierarchy is getting uh, supported by a particular narrative in the science? And maybe sometimes the correct answer is to say, why are we asking this question still? Are we still really stuck on this? Isn't there a better thing to ask about testosterone? Mm -hmm. And aren't there more reasonable, more rich ways of thinking about human behavior than trying to constantly drive something that you cannot often experimentally control well in, in humans and you can't come up with good animal models for. I mean, sometimes we're asking testosterone to answer the wrong questions. Mm -hmm. So that's one way that bringing social analysis in might shift some of that. Um, but I think it would also move us, I think you're right, it would move towards more interesting questions about, for example, how do social practices and hierarchies shape our bodies, which they do. Mm -hmm. how, do they, how, uh, how do they become embedded and actually shift, um, even at the molecular level? And there's some really interesting work in social epidemiology that does that in other domains. I don't see anything on testosterone even approaching that. But I think it could. So, so you, uh, you use the word uh, binary sometimes in your talk. So research that enforces, reinforces binary oppositions between genders. Right. Would that change if with new research? I think so. So to mention, I, I talked about the neurogenderings network. There are um, some amazing people trying to do new kinds of neuroscience that instead of always starting with categories of men and women, and then over and over again compare and look for differences and count differences and elaborate that. They say things like, what if we began instead with, instead of dividing everybody up by men and women, what if we were to uh, think about a wide range of the kinds of traits and characteristics that typically get associated with masculinity and femininity? Actually see how those things are distributed among people, and then look for other forms of patterns. One of the things that comes out of that is that our ideas that men are this way, women are that way, break down very quickly. If you take a look at, the, at even um, personality structure uh, across even three or four dimensions, let alone more than that. And so there are ways in which... Um, we could, the fact that we live in a world that is very firmly committed to a binary um, is, is a little bit challenged by some of this research. And, and uh, it can be hard to absorb, but it's actually quite interesting that even in this very binary world, there's a lot more complexity underneath you know, who we are in terms of our capacities our emotions, our relationships to each other, our sense of our bodies, all of these things that are typically thought of as quite, as quite rigidly gendered. So I think it does break down a binary. All right, interesting. Is there maybe a historical well, there, there perspective might, there, there, is, there is a, there might be another possibility, and that is that once this research becomes more complex, the uh, disconnect with social, cultural stories becomes bigger because the research mm. becomes more focused on itself, yeah. it's more uh, uh, led by its own dynamics. So you also run the risk then that mm -hmm. very interesting research on testosterone gets disconnected from wider social sure. and cultural stories about it, which in the, on the one hand might be a good thing to happen, I mean, let these stories live their own lives, but at the same time it would be a very unfortunate effect in the sense that you then have sort of a very classical division between science and 
wider social and cultural stories where science does affect our bodies through technology, but very little through um, the stories that then are no longer in connection with the science. Sure. I think that's a strong possibility. I also think there's another possibility worth mentioning, which is that um, the investment in the way things are done now is not just an idea. Mm. There's a material investment. There are research histories. There are huge grants that have already been made that you have to come up with your results for that grant that fit those questions. There are, you know, there, there's a real apparatus at stake that is very, it's like a train that's on tracks that the tracks got laid down a long time ago. And to, to take that train off the tracks is, is a train wreck. <laughs> it's not simply you change directions, you crash. And there's a huge risk about this is one reason why scientists take very few risks mm. in this regard. And the people who are taking these risks often don't have stable jobs and careers, can't get published, etc. Mm. Yes.